Well, hello there, everyone. It's been a minute or five or 10 or maybe, I don't know. But we know that on this show, on The Grit Files, we do talk about things that affect people's health. We talk about how as founders, female founders in particular, but not exclusively, how we go through a lot of things. And sometimes we have to really just make adjustments because we've got a need in our family or we have a personal need. So I took some time aside because I had some need. I wasn't feeling it anymore to just come totally fired up. And I'm excited because the show is back and better than ever. And we've got a huge lineup of guests coming up here over the next couple of months. And today we're very lucky. We've got Dr. David Lipman in the house and he's going to be talking to us about all of the kinds of things that maybe you don't think about, but when that back of yours is starting to ache and what's going on, or maybe it's your neck, maybe it's something else. We're going to get into that and really look at everything from spine adjustments all the way through to mindset adjustments, because that's what it takes. It takes a whole body experience to really be well. So with that, Dr. Lippman, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Laura Lynn. Nice to be here. Well, you've got a really interesting background. As I say, when we look at your channel here and we take a look at all of the kinds of stuff that you've got, you are based on physical evidence. In fact, that's really what drives you. And so we're going to get into some of that. But before we do, everybody likes the backstory first, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. in this case, right? Bum, right, so we can pardon the puns and, and just excuse the silliness Happens every but, time, <laughs> right? Right, right, yeah. That's like this one uh dentist that I knew, his name was Chip Silvertooth. I kid you not, and yeah, of course, the jokes just they just kind of fall out with it, right? Yeah, <laughs> so let's we have get a Cairo in town, Dr. Backman, just so you know. Oh, see, see, there you go. Like there has to be these people, right? It just, it makes the world much, much, much more interesting. And it's certainly on point with brand. Everybody's talking about personal brand these days. So I love it. It's just a direct fit. Now, Dr. David Lippman doesn't quite have the cachet. So we'll have to win over the audience here to make your name more memorable through all of the wonderful advice and the insights that you share with folks. So let's roll it back. Let's Let's go all the way back, right? Let's go back to the time where you started up, growing up in your parents' business and how that was the expectation. And then we'll get into your event that happened that changed things for you as a teenager. So let, let's start with that. What's, what's it like growing up in a family where it is all about the family business and the expectation is, of course, you're going to take over. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So, you know, at the time, and I, and I mean, probably from five or six, my dad will be taking him, me into the plumbing manufacturing factory and offices where they um, manufactured plumbing for, you know, places all over the country and even in the world. At one point, they were the largest independent supplier of tubular brass anywhere. And so it was a legacy thing. Um, my father's grandfather, my great grandfather started it. Um, his father went into it. My father went into it. And so it was, you know, expected that I would be the next one in line. So I was being groomed at a very young age. And at the time, you know, growing up, I didn't really think any about it. I thought, well, this is what dad does. This is what I'm going to do. You know, it's just se seemed to fall right into place. But a few things happened, um, you know, in, in my life, as you kind of referenced, and I'll even just backtrack once. When I was 10 years old, we moved to a new neighborhood and uh, it was a bit of a challenging environment. And um, I started get exercising and working out because I didn't want to be victimized. And there was a kid next door to me whose father was into martial arts. And he really inspired me to become strong and to become healthy, strong by working out and exercising and healthy by getting off the Captain Crunch and Pop-Tarts and Wonder Bread and start to eat real food. And I just took to it. And those values that it was instilled in me then started to you know, come forward in my life. And so that's really where I think the groundwork was laid to where I started to see the body as something, you know, magic and sacred and something that you can do something with and you can be strong. And, you know, I was motivated by not wanting to be a victim at the time, but it was more than that too. 
inherently. When I was 15, I had a motorcycle injury and I actually broke my neck in two places. But at the time, I kind of hit it because I wasn't supposed to be on a motorcycle. And, <laughs> well, um, <laughs> of course, and I was more afraid of my getting in trouble with my dad. And um, in the meantime, by the time I was about 18 and 19, my neck really started to give me problems. And I met during a summer job, this chiropractic student who got me into the clinic, um, gave me my first adjustment. And like in a moment, all that pain that I've been feeling for the last few years just started to like in a moment, like dissipate. And it was like one of those transformative moments, because first of all, I didn't even know what a chiropractor was. He told me he's a chiropractor. He's going to you know, take me in a clinic. And he was this big guy. He looked like Clark Kent. You know, he had glasses on. He had a he looked like he was ready to open that shirt and have a big S on his chest. So I just went with it. And something happened in that in that moment when that pain was gone. Something inside me said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this, but something drove me from inside. And so that moment was very transformative. Now, of course, the next step would be, OK, Dad, I got some news for you. <laughs> I don't really want to go into the family business. And fortunately, my dad, and I didn't know it at the time, but he told me and revealed this to me at that time when I said this to him. He said, look, I wasn't planning on going into the family business either. But wow. his father got very sick very quickly in his late 40s. And he ended up you know, passing away from cancer in his early 50s. And my dad, out of duty, I think, decided to, to, to take that spot. He felt that that was his duty to do it. But I think part of him was able to say to me, you know something, son, if you want to do something else, I've been there. You know, I made a different choice. What do you want to do? And I told him I wanted to be a chiropractor. I said, I don't even know what that's really going to be about, but that's what I want to do. And, and he was supportive. And it, and, it, and it changed the whole trajectory of what I thought, you know, my career life was going to be. And so that's incredible. I mean, we hear so many stories where people feel like they have to go down a particular path. They are predestined, whether it's a family business or they're a first generation college student and their parents say, we fought hard, we struggled, we've sacrificed, we left the homeland to come here to give you a better opportunity. And these kids feel so pressured, but then they go down a path that isn't theirs. How did you feel when you started to go down the path of chiropractic? Did you begin with some internships or things before you started school, David? Or, or how did that go down to really solidify that, yeah, this is the focus? So just like my dad was supportive of that fact, that first chiropractor became a mentor to me. He yes. actually suggested to me, he says, I think you could be good at this. What do you think about going into this field? And from that moment when I said yes, he started to have me come into clinic. I would get adjustments still. Um, he would show me x-rays. He would teach me about examinations and how to diagnose things. He showed me how to adjust before I even you know, started chiropractic school. And so by the time I actually went through all that and started to have that, that groundwork of actually saying, okay, here's a career I know nothing about, but here's this young guy that's, that's showing me. He sees something in me. He's mentoring me. And because my dad didn't know anything about that business. My dad was a brilliant guy in business, but not that business. He just didn't know it. And so when I actually graduated, this young guy had opened up his new office, a second office. And I started renting space from him. And he actually set um, up. Yeah, he taught me the business. I mean, I, they don't teach you business in, in chiropractic college. He teach you how to be a doctor, you know, and how to treat people. But they don't teach you the business. And he was right there. And it gave me the ability to have a, you know, a teacher along the way as I was getting out into the field and actually doing it. And it gave me that foundation to at least say, OK, I see how this is going to go. And from there, once I understood the basics of how to run that business, then that, you know, inner drive that also pushed me beyond just what chiropractic was presented to me as. And, you know, over the years, I've grown it into something that I call bio-optimization now. But it was that ability to have that mentor to kind of help me in those early years and stages to actually make the business work and understand that part. I want to come back and dig deeper into that piece. But first, you mentioned bio-optimization. And as a cool nerd, I always try to have things defined, not just for the benefit of the audience, but for me. I don't know what you mean by bio-optimization. So talk to us what that is. Yes, absolutely. So 
I had to think of what, what is it that I do here? You know, I'm a chiropractic physician, but we have other things here. We have red light therapy. We have the superhuman protocol. We do genetic testing to assess what nutrition somebody should really be getting for themselves based on the way their particular body works and how they process nutrients or how they might have problems because of mutations. So all of that put together. And then of course we have biohacking, which is, you know, been a buzzword in the last few years here too. So bio to me means the cell. And at the cellular level, you need to optimize the way that cell functions because from there, everything drops down to optimal health in that sense. You know, there's over 32,000 diseases known to humans. And the one thing that is completely the common denominator in every single one of them is some kind of loss at the cell level of making energy for that cell. So when that cell can't function because it can't make energy, it can't function for that particular tissue and that system, and then things break down. So that says to me that, you know something, we don't have 32,000 diseases. We have 32,000 symptoms of that cell not functioning optimally. Let's bio-optimize. Let's get that cell, the single most basic unit of function, to be optimally functioning with energy. That's it. And really through that, that combination of energy comes in through nutrition right? Just the same as you do with data, garbage in, garbage out, right? You want to put good things in. You talked about that your best friend's uh, neighbor, or I guess his father, sorry, you're a, as a child said, mm -hmm. stop eating the Wonder Bread and the Twinkies and all the rest. And I was thinking, those are so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to give up, right? Yeah, I think for me, the motivation of the idea of being strong and healthy uh, was very motivating to me. It, it, you know, I guess it maybe it was already in me in some way, but, you know, again, like I said, we moved to a challenging neighborhood. Um, I didn't want to be victimized, you know, from the first few weeks I was there, there was, you know, issues that started up. Um, and he decided to say, Hey, you know what, let's start working out together. He was a few years older than me. Uh, we went into the basement, started doing pull-ups and push-ups, and we had a heavy bag with punching and kicking. And I just, I think that inner drive for me about the getting strong part was, was key, but also about how eating the right food was going to feed that strength. And, you know, I didn't realize it at the time as the way I understand it to be now, how impactful nutrition is. And we could talk about oxygen a little while because our cells need two things. We need nutrients and we need oxygen. That's how we optimally function to make energy. But that's where I think my inner motivation was to, to eat that food that was going to feed that strength that I wanted to just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So that's how it kind of started out for me. Of course, it's much different now, but it's still about being strong for your everyday life, not worrying about getting into fights in the street, but how you can navigate your daily test with resilience, especially I'm in my 60s, and feel great. You look, you look great, if I may Thank say, you. just to be so bold. I mean, that's what I'm really curious about, and I know our audience is going to be curious about, what if you don't start as a teenager, David, that now you're 40, maybe 50, maybe 60, and you're going, dang, I ate a lot of Twinkies and a lot of Doritos and a lot of processed lunch meat and all this sort of stuff throughout my lifetime, and I'm feeling sluggish and not so good now. Is it too late? Can I reverse any of the damage that I did by not having a focus on healthy nutrition growing up? Can I reverse it? Well, um, from a physiological standpoint, absolutely. As long as you're still living and breathing, your body can respond. Stress adaptation is how our bodies change um, for the positive. We stress it, let's say from an exercise standpoint, force it to work harder than it's accustomed to. The adaptation is our muscles will get stronger. Our cardiovascular system will become more efficient. We'll get more efficient at using energy for those tasks. But the key, I think, is, is that mental aspect. How badly do you want that difference to be in your life? Do you, are you more interested in how good the pizza tastes and how good the chocolate tastes? Or are you more interested in how you might be able to feel on a regular basis compared to how you might feel now? Now, listen, a lot of people might need guidance because not everybody knows what's my first step to actually go into that direction. But there's resources. And I try to be that resource to certainly people here in my office but there's also ways to prevent, you know, to, to present that information and get somebody going. But it has to come from them, Laurelyn. 
You're the one that's walking around in that body every day. If you've never worked out in your whole life and tomorrow you're going to start, what you do every day is going to have way more of an impact than I could ever have as your you know, physician or um, your coach or whatever it is. So something within has to flip the switch. And as long as you're looking for the information and you're willing to own that and invest in yourself, because that's what it comes down to. It's an investment in health. Do you want to just manage the decline of your you know, daily degeneration or, uh, or do you want to invest in the incline of your health? Why can't you get stronger as you get older? Why can't you get more healthier? I believe you can. I was just reading, I forget the gentleman's name, but he became an ultra marathoner at mm-hmm. 55. Yeah. Never ran a day in his life. He was 40, 50 something pounds overweight and decided I'm going to not just run marathons, going to do ultra marathons and do 75 clicks at a time and right. run that consecutive days, seven, 10, 12 days in a row. Mm-hmm. And what he did is he said he just started from the inside out. And he said before he even started thinking about which foods he was going to eat, and he's a big believer in bone broths and mesos and things like this and otherwise plant-based. But he said he looked at where he was And he said, mentally, am I ready for this? What do I really want? Do I want to keep living like this? Do I want the pain in my knees? Do I want that jiggle in my belly and just feel uncomfortable every time I put a seatbelt on? And he said, I started there and I worked my way through and did a little, a little, a little every day until he said he looked at himself in totality and changed everything. And it sounds very much like your program because it's physical evidence-based where you look at the genetics of people. Oh, can I process gluten? Laura, maybe stay away from that. Can, or what types of exercise should I do? Or am I out of alignment because of how I sit and I have bad posture and I need a better ergonomic chair? Like, I love that you look at everything. What my question is now after that long preamble Mm -hmm. is how do you find the time to set the priorities and say, yes, I am going to balance my own wellness because you not only have an example for all of the clients that you see, but for all of your staff. And so talk to me about that dynamic and how you lead by example. I think this is really important. For me, when I started out at 10 exercising, it was always first thing in the morning. Back then it was probably, you know, 5.30 or 6 a.m., I've naturally been an early riser from, you know, the time I was very young. My mom even taught me how to make breakfast for myself because she wanted to sleep to 730 and I was up at six. So I'd have breakfast by myself and then she'd make me another one when she woke up. So I, I have that early riser in me. And once I started to do that with the kid next door when I was 10, that became my, my daily activity, exercise first thing in the morning. And even as I grew and would travel, the first thing I do when I go to a place, whether it's vacation or visiting, I'd open up the yellow pages and look up health clubs and see which one was around, where was it, call them up, make sure I can get there early in the morning. So that's been part of my structured regimen since since that very young age. And, and it's still that way today. So even when I travel, I'm making sure if there's not a fitness center in the hotel I'm at, that there's one nearby. And I already have that set up because my body is so used to waking up with exertion and activity to kind of power me up through the rest of the day. Now, I actually start a little bit earlier these days because once I got the superhuman protocol in my office, which is how we optimize oxygenation and energy production at the cell level, I get here at 4 a.m., I do my protocol, I get to the gym by 5, I get home, and I get back to the office by 7 to start working. And so I'm on my feet for about 12 straight hours exerting myself, moving, which keeps powering me up. On the other side of that, for recovery, what do I do? I'll do cold plunges. I just came out of one before I got on the show with you. Okay. Maybe that's the glow I'm seeing. (laughs) Right? There you go. Well, it's here every day because I do it every day. (laughs) So, But it's it's all the things, honestly. I mean, you know, even my skin is so much better since I've been doing red light therapy. And, you know, being in my 60s, it's it's very healthy. It's elastic. Um, and it was a time in my 50s. It wasn't quite as, as much. Now I look at pictures of myself back then. But so it's essential for me to put those components of my recovery and my wellness in my day. Much of it's in the first time part of the day. But sometimes it's on the weekends, too, doing IV vitamin drips. And, um, you know, again, that cryotherapy of cold plunging all the time. And I'm trying to get barefoot on the, you know, the, gra- the sand or the grass, 
we we live by the beach here so we try to get to the beach you know as often as possible but even like what i started to do is i have a barbecue that i do because i'm on the carnivore diet too so i'm eating animal protein all the time and so i i have my barbecue right by the grass so while i'm barbecuing i got my bare feet on the grass so i'm trying to keep all those exposures in a positive way to the things in like my daily you know life because if i don't plan for them they're just not going to happen now let's talk about that too, the whole bare feet and touching the grass and getting grounded, how this is useful and recommended for meditation techniques. Is this where you use it or just try to, again, like so many of us, right? Multitask, two for three for four for things, one, you know, that we can do at once. Talk to us about what draws you to the grass and the importance of the bare feet on the grass and that connection. So that has to do with the fact that we, our bodies, are electromagnetic in how our physiolo physiological functions happen. Plus and minus charges exchanging are how, as an example, our nervous system works. Our nerve conduction happens because of plus and minus charges. And there's minerals and elements like sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, and uh, magnesium that have special charges, plus or minus charges that facilitate that when we have muscle contractions when we bring nutrients from our bloodstream into the cell itself and remove waste products that have been utilized and, you know, after cell metabolism. But it's also the way our red blood cells carry oxygen from our lungs to our tissues. So that plus and minus charge balance is essential to our functioning. So we are electromagnetic beings, but guess what? We don't have a battery. The earth has been our battery for centuries. And as long as we've been on the earth, it's been our batteries. But in our modern day, we've paved over it. We walk on concrete slabs. We have rubber soles, many of us. So we're not getting that pulse. The other hand, the other side of that is that all this electricity around us and wireless and 5G and our devices and Bluetooth are causing what's called EMFs or high frequency electromagnetic fields that harm our normal plus and minus balances for all our physiological processes. And some people are even more susceptible to absorbing them and interrupting their functionality than others. So the earth or putting bare feet on the earth gets that pulse to renew all of that proper plus and minus charging so that physiology can start to be optimally functioning again. It'll actually clear out EMFs if you happen to be somebody that holds on to them. It'll clear them out just for simple 20 to 30 minutes barefoot on the grass or on the dirt or on the sand at the beach will actually clear that out. That's part of what our environment that we have in this world around us is for. You think it's a coincidence that the very earth that we, we walk on has the very thing we need to, to get our plus and minus charges optimized? I don't think so. Also with the negative charges, I know that alcohol and things like that, as we're breaking it down, we create all of these free radicals in our body and we've heard about these. And so we are being conditioned that we need to buy more superfoods, right? The super berries, acai and these kinds of things. And any of the cruciferous plants, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, spinach, all of that sort of good stuff to help counter those. Can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the examples that are accessible to our audience? Not everybody has access to cryotherapy and do a daily plunge. Not everybody has access to a beach and the ocean and the healing and the and the waves that come through that. Talk to us about some really simple advice that the everyday person living in an apartment in Manhattan, <laughs> where I am, that they could do something about it. Yeah, so drive out to Long Island on the weekends, get on the beach, do some Wim Hof deep breathing to get that oxygen in and get some sun on you. No, I mean, that that's true what I just said, because that I guarantee you do that five or six days in a row, it's going to change your life. However, free radicals, to go back to that, free radicals are from the pollutants that we're taking in, whether it's through the air, the water, or food, you know, knowingly or unknowingly. And free radicals are molecules that lack an outer electron in their outer shell of that molecule. And when they lack that, they're looking to fill that gap. Now, when they're in our body, guess where they're getting it from? They're getting it from our own cells. And they're going to steal that if they're inside our cells from our own cell organelles. But worse than that, they will compete 
with oxygen to get on the part of our cell called the mitochondria, which makes energy for that cell. And they will not allow oxygen to come on. They'll be stuck to the spot where oxygen should be. So antioxidants and red light therapy, which again is, is part of what's here, will actually disassociate those free radicals from the mitochondria so oxygen can come in and get in its proper place to optimize energy. If a free radical, as an example, is in a cell and that cell's making energy, it only runs at about two horsepower. It's not horsepower, but it'll make the point. When oxygen is allowed to, because of antioxidants, dissociating that free radical away and oxygen gets in, it runs it at 34 horsepower. So the difference between having your cell at two horsepower and 34 horsepower is the difference between bio-optimizing a cell or not. So that's how those free radicals are dissociated with antioxidants. And some people respond better to certain ones than others. When we talk about those free radicals for people in our audience that maybe aren't biologically, I guess, like attuned with some of the background and stuff that you've had or that I've had. Mm -hmm. I like to think of them as these energy vampires, right? Because they're trying to get into the mitochondria and say, no, no, you don't get access. Right, and I right. love, I just had this visual as you were talking about your red light therapy. And I was thinking, ah, the red light therapy, that's the vampire killer, right? It kills the energy vampires that are these free radicals that are trying to take our mitochondria hostage and not allow us to have the energy we need to flow and to be healthy. Right. Well, light kills vampires, right? Isn't that what right. we saw in the movies? Red light. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You go up to the vampires. I think, I think, I don't know. I, it was silly. It's Friday afternoon. There we go. Right. That's just how it works. So talk to us about when you feel your system is becoming misaligned and by misaligned could be physically, maybe you need some adjustment or you've had some certain stressors, some things that have happened to you in the past few weeks, months, whatever that they're accumulating. And you realize I, I'm not where I normally am. How do you, what are the signs that tell you, hey, David, knock, 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 pause, 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 it's time to take a look. And then what do you do to correct? Because we have so many founders that listen to this show that mm -hmm. there, no one has time. And everybody's like, oh, I don't know. I just, I'll ignore it. Yeah, that my back, the sciatic, I know I can't walk. I can't feel, but I'm going to ignore it, right? What are your signs and what do you do about it? So um, just talk about the physical, like the musculoskeletal system, look at, you know, at the pain syndromes. So I've got, again, I broke my neck. I've uh, dislocated my shoulder. I was diagnosed with bone on bone and a shoulder need for shoulder replacement a year ago. I did stem cells. It's fine. Um, I've also ruptured a disc in my low back and I had loss of function in my right leg, but that's all resolved too. So the reason I say this is because despite structural damage and, you know, mileage over the years, if you exercise in a way that continues to keep your body mobile, flexible, and functionally strong, the chances are that the things in your daily life that you're doing task-wise are not going to move you out of that, you know, homeostasis, let's call it, from a musculoskeletal standpoint. So to stay as balanced on the left and the right side of your body and keeping that musculature to be as symmetrical as possible. And I also have tools in the office too, like I have whole body vibration. I use my whole body vibration platform every single day before I go to the gym and I have a stretch routine I do on it. So that vibration helps to facilitate loosening the joints, loosening any tight muscles that might've, you know, come, come over from the, you know, the day before the night before from sleeping. So I am so tuned in and locked into my regiment that keeps me as resilient, energetic as possible. But if I were to say, if there was one thing that was making me feel off, I have to say that the stress adaptation of cold plunge, a whole body cryotherapy, we have this built-in physiological response that takes care of so many things, not only just inflammation, but boosts our immune system, our growth hormone. It boosts all those hormones and neurotransmitters that make us feel good, you know, dopamine and serotonin. So because we have as mammals that physiological response, I think that a person that was not feeling quite there if they get in and got into cold water, if they don't have a cold plunge, go get some ice and put it in your bathtub. I mean, literally, you know, it's it's something you could do at home. But those things are really effective at resetting your body to, you know, get you into this stress adaptation. You know what? The more convenient our lives are, the more unhealthy 
we will become. It's so true, right? Just too easy. Go to the grocery store, grab a it's ready, whatever it is in the package, packaged meals. You don't look at what's all in it. I right. know that there's often MSGs, high salts, all of these kinds of things that really aren't good for us. And you just take it. Oh, it's that convenience of it, right? Oh, and then what do you do? Oh, you put it in the microwave to heat it. Right, right. Like, let's add more crap into us. And so you're right. The more convenient things are, the less healthy that we become. We're almost in the home stretch here. So big question. Do you think founders should consider investing in their health to whatever extent they want, cryotherapy, plunges, genetic analysis so that their nutrition is aligned with their genetic constitution or whatever other red light therapy to get rid of all of those nasty little energy vampire free radicals? Do you think founders should invest in their health as a business strategy and be as disciplined about it as they are? regarding their goals for their business. Talk to us about your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, my dad told me a long time ago, how you do anything is how you do everything. And one <laughs> of the things that I like about the discipline of getting up and being in my office at four in the morning and doing all those things, even though, listen, sometimes I might drag myself here, but I've never left the workout saying, oh, I should have stayed home sleeping. So the discipline that will get me through a tougher day in the morning where I, you know, aren't as energetic getting to the, you know, to the office and the gym, but I'm also building something that can transfer into other things. You know, the discipline in business, as an example, for me, I, you know, I did start out in a traditional chiropractic type practice, but over the years it's evolved because I saw things, I had visions of things I saw down the road that certain things that could be incorporated to, again, bolster the body, to get the body to be as functional as possible from an energetic standpoint, a functional standpoint, musculoskeletal, and our brains. I mean, our brains need so much to, to really, you know, it takes most of the energy that we create is for our brains. And, you know, we have so much in this environment these days that are, you know, toxic and poisoning us. And, you know, we need to invest in, you know, you don't, you can't do a three day water fast and your detox. It's nothing like that. You have to detox every single day to lighten the load on your body because your body's got its detox processes, but it gets overwhelmed with the kind of environments we're living in. And so we need to, we need self-care. We don't need health care. We need self-care. We need to be our own doctors. We need to be proactive and invest in our health because in the modern world we live in, it's going to escape us, but it's the same discipline that we need in business. We need to translate that to the same thing in our bodies in terms of, you know, managing them and be the, you know, the, the, the caretakers of ourselves. Oh, I love that. Self-care over health care, right? Yeah. Of course we need all of it when we get really sick and you need those other opportunities to be able to go right. to, but start first with what you can do. You've given us so many simple tips, put our feet on the ground, touch the sand, touch the grass, right? Don't be afraid of the bacteria that are there. Mm. There's too many people that are all these germaphobes. Yeah. Get out there. It's actually good for you. Think about what you're eating. Have some discipline in the morning. Work out. Now, the cryotherapy thing. I will share, as a Canuck, growing <laughs> up in the Great White North, way up mm. there where the trees are already, well, they're more like bushes. They're not really very tall. Mm. We used to take a sauna, and then we'd go jump in the snow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could do that now. And I've even done some of the dips, you know, the lake, the ice cut and go, I don't know that I could do that anymore. Just talk to us about how you have to mentally prepare for that ice dip. Well, there's, there's two things. First, just to speak to what you just said, if you think you can do it, or if you think you can't do it, you're right either way. So mm -hmm. it's, it's coming from you. Now, from, from a tech, from a technique standpoint, one of the ways that you can sort of make it easier from the get-go is as you immerse yourself into the cold, you exhale. Because if you do that, you'll shut off that a respiratory rest kind of like kind of thing where you feel like you're, you're losing your breath. But if you control that breathing by first exhaling and then going to a slow controlled inhale and then exhale, that will get your body's breathing where you can now get into that. I'm not going to say a meditative state, but in a deep breathing rhythm where your body is going to be able to tolerate that, you know, radical temperature change 
because it's not going to disrupt your, your breathing pattern. And that is how I recommend to people trying it for the first time to, to go about doing it. And um, again, as long as you don't have any cardiovascular issues or reason where you might be risking something if you have high blood pressure that's not managed, something like that, your body can tolerate it. We have built-in mechanisms to actually have good responses and, and physiological benefit from it. It's a mental game more than anything. And if you're able to, to use that, and, and use it as a discipline too, because the discipline of sitting in 40 degrees or 45 degrees of water for five or six minutes and just breathing through it, that same discipline can be used in so many ways for so many other things. So I'll take it that you do think a business strategy is a self-care strategy, Absolutely. right? We should, we should invest equally into that as we do into our business and business goals. Absolutely. All right. So we've got our last question. It's our signature question here at the Grit Files. Mm -hmm. If we had a peek into your closet, David, and we got to see your footwear there, what is the pair of footwear, sandals, sneakers, whatever it is that best exemplifies your personality and who you are? What are we looking at? So that's a really great question. And the answer to that has evolved over time. I had um, somewhat flat feet when I was a kid. And when I first became a chiropractor, one of the, the businesses that would um, supply us were um, foot levelers. They have um, custom arch supports. And so I started to have problems, even in my 20s, like wearing shoes because of my arches being fallen, playing, you know, ball in the street with bare feet when I was a kid. And so I really became a believer and user of orthotics. But inherently inside me, I always knew that, you know what, we're relying on something outside the body to fix itself. And so we're relying on a, a support that's only a functioning when we're wearing shoes and wearing the supports. But like every other muscle in the body, which I knew that if we have any injuries or weaknesses, we have to strengthen them. Otherwise, we're not going to really resolve those. Now, coming down to the feet, we weren't born with shoes on. We have muscles and mechanics of our feet that are, you know, supposed to support and, you know, locomote our entire body. So more recently, I've adopted some of the Vivo footwear, which is a very minimalist, minimalistic um, type of shoe. I started using it first in the gym. And now I've actually started using it here in the office because it's forcing my feet to work at a much higher level and they've become more stable around my ankles. And I actually, after so many years of wearing orthotics, are starting to feel like I'm getting to the point where I don't need to wear them anymore. It's not quite there yet. So that was very, um, you know, it was a turning point for me because, like, I knew I was kind of living like almost a hypocrisy by wearing orthotics based on the rest of the belief system I had. And, you know, when Vivos came out and then actually my youngest son got them before I did, I said, you know something, I got to try these out. I got to see if I can rehabilitate, you know, these feet that have been, you know, wearing a coffin for, you know, 40 years. And um, so that's been very, very positive so far. Excellent. Well, it's good when everything we talked about, the personal brand fits, right? You have the right name, you have the right bits, and you just, you really live what you do. And I think that's a tremendous example and we can all learn from it. And I hope all of the folks that were listening here today to Dr. David Lipman, chiropractor and founder of Physical Evidence based in Florida. But don't fret if you're not in the Florida area. Hopefully, Dr. Lipman will want to come back on the show another time and we can get some more advice and all kinds of goodies to help all of you who are learning here virtually. So thank you very much, Dr. Lipman. My pleasure, Laurel, and thanks so much for having me here. It was a really great pleasure to have the conversation, and I hope it you know brings value to people that are listening. I think so. I got a lot of value out of it. So <laughs> stay tuned for more. Okay. And how about that fantastic intro by Touch Circle? <laughs>